Welcome to the Inside Scoop Live podcast, where indie authors get personal about their books, their writing, and their passions. I'm your host, Sherry Hoyt. Join me for some lively conversations with debut indie authors and seasoned veterans alike. It's a great place to find your next amazing read or even get inspired. So sit back and enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Hi, everyone. Joining me today on the show is author Shayla Johnson and screenwriter and producer J.R. Santana to talk about Perpetual Gloom, the first book in a historical fiction trilogy. Before we get started, here's the inside scoop on my guests. Shayla Johnson is the recipient of nine awards from the Society for Technical Communication and is also a published photographer and has produced and directed more than 40 lifestyle broadcast segments focused on eco and small space living. She directed, produced, and is the co-creator of the documentary series Where Small Business Grows on Amazon Prime. Shayla lives a life of voluntary simplicity where she makes a mid-century modern airstream her home on an island in the Pacific Northwest. She enjoys kayaking and traveling across the country and around the world. J.R. Santana is an award-winning screenwriter and producer. With over three decades of experience working in Hollywood and Europe, J.R. has been involved in productions ranging from $1 million to $25 million, all with an A-list cast. As a screenwriter, he won the Kodak Award for Outstanding Cinematic Achievement, the Turner Classic Movies Prize, Best Film at the Interfilm Berlin Film Festival, as well as being nominated for two consecutive BAFTA awards. He also holds a master's degree from Cambridge University. When not working, J.R. spends his free time riding his vintage British motorcycle, competing in international long-range match rifle competitions, and penning his debut novel. For more information about Shayla Johnson, J.R. Santana, and their work, visit thebalonetrail.com. Hi, Shayla, J.R. Welcome to Inside Scoop Live. Hi, Sherry. How are you? Yeah, thank you for having us. Absolutely. I have been looking forward to talking with y'all ever since I read the book. So, Shayla, why don't you kick things off? Tell us a little bit about Perpetual Gloom and the Baloney Trail trilogy. Yeah, so Perpetual Gloom is actually the first book within the Baloney Trail trilogy. And it's based on true events that portrays the Hornbuck family, who we first meet them during the Great Depression, where they're struggling to survive. And then later on throughout the trilogy, we find that they eventually become involved in the birth of the uh, Mexican Sinaloa cartel. So they're, you know, striving and we kind of see them struggle along throughout a period that begins in the early 1930s. And we finish with them in the early 1970s. Mm. So we're covering quite a number of decades as the family kind of grows and as they move along and we kind of see where they start and where we finish with them. Yeah. And so what was it about that era that first piqued your interest in writing this story? Well, one is that, I mean, writing about the Great Depression is very interesting because we still have generations alive that have lived through that piece of our history, not only in the U.S. history, but also world history. You know, there was World War II that happened in there. So there were a lot of significant changes, the Dust Bowl. There were a lot of uh, challenges for families in general. Mm -hmm. Um, And then if we're looking at where they ended up or where we last see them, at that Sinaloa cartel, we wonder how they got to that place. Because, I mean, here was a very, you know, strong family that had generations in history in in the South. Their families came over to the U.S. in the early 1600s. So how did they get from one point to another point to another point? And at first, I was just going to deal with the Sinaloa cartel this family, the early stages of it. But I don't think that people would have really understand how that family actually got there in the first place, because it's kind of an unusual and very different story. So you have to kind of back up and say what led them to that place. Mm -hmm. And so the easiest place, or for me anyway, or the most prominent space was during that, you know, 1930s time period or the late you know, during that Great Depression time. 
So then you can start seeing how things are moving through the family structure and also what decisions that they were making and what decisions they were forced to make. So then that kind of gives us a good path to understand what happens in their future. Yeah. It was very interesting to me to learn about that segment of American history. Now, JR, you're from the UK. What drew you to the story? I think there were some common factors with, you know, if you look at the, the Great Depression and the famine, the Dust Bowl. I mean, over here we have, you know, going back uh, many generations, we had the Great Famine in Ireland, which uh, the Civil War here, which kind of precipitated a great exodus, mm. either forced or voluntary, to the new colony then. And of course, I just loved, like you show, I just loved getting that view on part of history that I, I wasn't really familiar with, apart from seeing a few of the photographs and being aware of it in general, but the kind of the real detail of it, the struggle of it yeah. uh, on a human level, I found really fascinating. And we've seen these things depicted in films and on TV, but this had that firsthand authenticity about it, which I just couldn't resist and which had resonance with so many of the things that were mirrored over here and, and across Europe as well. Yeah, the issues, all of the societal issues, like you said, they aren't limited to America. The story just really holds a global interest. And just the parallels to today's society really impacted me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I've done a little bit of research on this in, in the background for other projects. And but it's fascinating to see how, for example, with the, the story about uh, the, the famine in Ireland, the Civil War, how Many families were displaced and arrived in, in the States. And, you know, they were literally just in either indentured servants or slaves or just, you know, exiled from their estates in Ireland. Yeah. And uh, interestingly enough, I think we get the, the, the term redneck from because mm. when these guys arrived, they couldn't cope with the heat and they were working the fields. And, and it was just impossible. It was impossible. So, so these very kind of fair <laughs> people <laughs> arriving in the deep south, having to work these farms and, and just got used to it. I think that's where the, the origin of that came from, just as an aside. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. There's so many interesting yeah. little tidbits to this story. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I think that we, there's a lot of influence in this country from places like Europe and uh, mm. Ireland and England and yeah. and you know, Scotland and things like this. I mean, they were the early arrivers, you know, mm -hmm. into this country. And a lot of our music actually comes from, you know, tunes and things that we may hear in this country have maybe changed the words, the lyrics of them. But many of the tunes are those same ones that came over. So when you look at it, you know, we're looking at American history, but it's a much broader history because the founding people are from, other countries who came over. So really, in fact, it's part of their history, too, yeah. because yeah. of their families that actually had left those countries and had, you know, started new lives here in America. Yeah. There were parts of the story that were some issues just, I mean, shocking. I think especially the parallels to today's society really affected me, like the treatment of the oppressed and marginalized and the stigmatized group, uh, religious zealotry, white supremacy. I mean, I could go on, you know. What yeah, yeah. What surprised you most when you were doing your research on all of these issues? There's so much in this story. Well, yeah, th what surprises me the most is that when we're looking at that time period of like the 30s, and what really surprises me is that we're still doing it today. It's like we have we have failed to learn the lesson. Yeah. And so and that is surprising because even if we look at women's rights and women's rights over their own bodies, I mean, we have that then we're still on the book that it was, I believe that there were some states right up into the 80s still had that it was okay to beat your wife mm. you know legally it was okay and it was like no uh so you know here we we're still fighting for those rights that we have over ourselves but then we see this what springs up is this kind of fundamentalist this you know just extremism mm -hmm. in that and we have this period where we thought that we had moved beyond that 
to, you know, kind of allow people to worship and to have belief that work for them. And now we're right back to where we were earlier in those 30s. And we went through a low period where we were kind of open and accepted in the early 20s. But now we're right back into those 30s where we're putting the hammer down on people who do not believe as we do. And that's distressing that we still haven't learned that lesson, that we haven't moved beyond. We haven't, our growth seems to have stunted or that we keep going in this perpetual circle all the time Mm -hmm. and we just can't seem to get out of it. And the same with climate. I mean, the Dust Bowl was a climate issue. People were misusing the land and it failed them. And now we have, look at, I mean, just in these last weeks that we've had tornadoes that are devastating. Mm -hmm. Um, And no one's raising the flag in these particular locations saying, oh, guess what? This is a result of our misuse of our environment. And yet we're Mm -hmm. still not learning that lesson. And that's the same thing that the people did in the Dust Bowl, which caused a complete famine in many parts of the country. Yeah. So we're just not learning. And that is surprising is that we, as smart as we think we are, as a collective group who are able to come up with, you know, technology, multiple technologies. We all have smartphones. We all have computers. We're all supposedly well-informed with information, but we keep making the same mistakes that people did who didn't even have a radio and people who couldn't even read. I know. So <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> really? <laughs> it is crazy. And that, I think, will always surprise me because with all these tools in front of us, Why are we not grasping it? Why are we still headed in the same direction? Why are we still making the same mistakes? There's no excuse for it. Then I can almost see an excuse because, you know, education was pretty sparse when you moved out west or you were working in fields in Ireland or whatnot, you know, and you didn't go to school. So maybe you didn't learn to read. But now everyone reads. And everyone has access to information and data. But what are we doing? We are saying to libraries and schools that we're going to ban some of these education pieces. Right. And that is very troubling, you know, when we put a stop to learning, basically. Yeah, it's very disheartening. And I think I wrote, I don't know if what I wrote in my review, something about the, the things that are talked about in perpetual gloom should keep everyone up at night. Or something like that. Yes. I mean, <laughs> you, did, you did say that. I read that. I thought that was great, by the way. It was like, yeah, it really should. Yeah. Did you have the progression from the novel to the big screen in mind when you started the project? You know, when I first started, and I do what every, probably every other writer does, is that we write it, we break it, we fix it. And so, you know, it's just this repetition circle until it feels right. And I did that actually 28 different times. I mean, which is a lot of revisions and reviews. So it took me a long time to just write the first book. But the manuscript did not feel right or read right until I figured out that it needs to be written in scenes. Mm. And once I got the idea it miraculously just fell into place. You know, it was just like, wow, why did it take me 28 different revisions to get to this point? But it did. And from that point on, it was, yes, this is a very visual thing. This is a feeling thing. It's mm-hmm. not only feeling with words, but I have to, I see it in my head as a moving picture almost. And so that's when it started falling together for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. It is very visual. And I was telling JR before we started, you truly have a gift with words. Just the way you place all your words together, (laughs) it's it's phenomenal. You know, a friend of mine told me years ago, and she kept saying this over and over, and she's an author and a writer in, in L.A., and she goes, I don't know, Shayla, what you just speak and write like 
you're a foreigner. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't think so. I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what that means, but you have all the words we all have, but the way you put them together, mm, that's good stuff. (laughs) So JR, can you tell us a little bit about how your partnership transpired? How did all this come together? Well, yeah. I mean, Shayla approached me with the book and the idea of adapting it as a pilot or a film or just uh, evolving it from where it was. And to be honest, it was an absolute dream. When she sent it to me, I just started reading it and I just I didn't put it down because there were so many scenes in it that I just wanted to write. I mean, and the, the dialogue was just so sparkling and so sharp and so original. It was just an absolute dream. So we progressed from initially talking about adapting it as a pilot. I think that was the first incarnation of it to eventually just partnering across the board because we realized this thing was bigger than just a compartmentalized set of rights, you know, whether it be Mm. the publishing the book or the TV series. But we certainly plumped for for a TV series side of things because there is so much in it and there are so many little sidebars and little tributaries that are are so you know they're worth exploring and only a a series can really do that yeah so is that what it's going to look like then a a series type production yeah i think so i think so throughout the book there's so much conflict and drama and i mean conflict in not an aggressive way i mean conflict in in a sense of dilemmas and contradictions and moral conundrums which Mm. are facing the character and facing them in a very real way that we can relate to and you place that and i see them as characters that they are real people of course but you you see those characters in the world of that story which again is very very unique and unusual it just makes for something that's very very compelling to not only write and research from my point of view but i'm i'm hopeful we're hopeful uh for an audience to watch yeah Absolutely. I think so. Now, you mentioned the characters are real. And Shayla, I know you were in contact with the family while you were researching your story. I'm curious if you keep in touch and and wondering how they feel about the books and then the plan to take it to the screen. So it was a very complicated piece connecting with them. One is that the generation that's being featured in this series have pretty much have died. And there's only one or two that are left. Mm. The oldest one I was able, it took me a number of years to locate him because they move around a lot. I mean, Mm. they still, you know, this guy's almost, you know, pushing 90 and still moving, you know, everywhere. You know, tracked him down in Canada once. And then by the time I get there and try to get there, he's gone. And then it's back down to Texas and gone. And, you know, I mean, they're just like all over oh, wow. the place. And so it was really hard to actually get a hold of them. There were a couple of other, some of the younger siblings that were still living, but they were in care and not, you know, not doing well. There was mm. another brother who was in Arizona, but he had dementia. So there was not a lot that you could, you know, connect with. But the one person that I was uh, able to connect with was a very vital part of the whole story, the early days of reconfirming and actually enlightening and bringing some new insight into the beginning in that first book in the early years in the 30s and 40s and 50s and, and somewhat into the 60s who was a participant in many of the activities. So Mm -hmm. he was a great resource. As far as, you know, kind of keeping in touch with him, he definitely is one of the zealots. And he is very cautious in the sense of developing relationships Mm -hmm. with people outside of their religion. So I was able to have about four interactions with him and his children and was able to look at a lot of imagery. He had photographs, he played music, he he had actually been in um, jail many, many times himself uh, for some of the shenanigans. Um, 
you know, when I got to see a jewelry box that he made out of popsicle sticks while he was uh, on the county farm. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, a number of other things. But keeping a relationship was out of the question. I mean, he asked if I would join, you know, the religious movement that he was in. And I, you know, answered honestly that I would not. And mm-hmm. that just kind of ended that opportunity just kind of dried up very quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. At that point. But there were some children of the other siblings that I spoke with that are not part of that what I want to call a, you know, zealot cult, if you will. And we have, you know, exchanged emails and, you know, connected on LinkedIn and things like that. And, Mm. you know, they definitely have moved on with their lives and they actually do not want to look back. I mean, they have made a life for themselves in a kind of modern society. Um, They believe in going to, you know, furthering their education and going to college, which is not allowed in their religious order. So they have moved on. And I think I can totally understand where they, you know, don't want to look back at all. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, just that's a that's a whole story in and of itself. So what's it been like working together to bring your story to life? Well, from my perspective, it's been extremely productive. I think we started out with just constructing a framework for how we were going to collaborate. And I think it was, Shayla came up with it. And it's very, very simple. It's the best idea wins. Mm-hmm. And really that, that kind of carries through through everything we're doing in the project, whether that be talking about a, a deal somewhere down the road with a, a streaming service or, or just talking about uh, a line in the pilot script, you know. And I think for me, Shelley was very generous in, in giving me that carte blanche to take the book and structure it for the pilot as I saw fit, which meant actually losing a lot of material for mm. the pilot, but things that will uh, hopefully find their way back into the episodes and into the first season at least. Uh, for me, the biggest headache completely was having to leave things out because there are so many rich scenes and and said little tributaries to explore. I struggled with what what am I going to, not what I'm, what I'm going to put in, what am I going to leave out? I just didn't want to leave anything out. But of course, for the pilot, we have to, we have to kind of capture the mood yeah. uh, at the beginning. But hopefully we can revisit those, uh, those little things uh, later on. Yeah, I can totally see that. Because I, I think I said this earlier, there's a lot packed into this book and it's not that mm. long. It's just, it's just full, <laughs> chock full of, yeah. there's like no sentence wasted. You know, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. well, I'm, I'm sure that was a tough job. I, I wouldn't want to leave anything out either. Yeah. Well, it's usually the other way around. It's usually struggling to find and researching and trying to, to fill the scenes. But it was a case of nah, what are, I'm going to have to cut this. I really don't want to cut this. Yeah. But it's like, OK, well, that serves what we're doing right now for the pilot. So it'll have to just sit on the, uh, you know, the back burner for, for a moment. Yeah. So does the pilot, is it kind of an overview of what the series is going to be about or how, do, and then you backtrack? How does that work? Um, yeah, we, I think the objective of it was to try and capture the mood of the book and the direction of the, how the characters, basically. Mm. We start with one of the principal characters as a young boy, Monroe. And obviously, Munro grows he, because a, a young man and a, and a grown man, as the season progresses, he becomes the central the character, which then changes as well as we move into in book two. So it was just trying to capture a journey, establish the main characters uh, and the, the through line of the action and that kind of emotional resonance that you could really get the flavor of what, the, what to expect in the book. Mm-hmm. And I wonder about, uh, you know, all of the story elements and how they align with so many of the issues that we talked about earlier in today's society. Will that affect the marketability? I think it's to some extent it it helps. You know, I I think audiences like to align themselves. We've seen it on other productions in the past. They, They like to align themselves with the issues of the day, but told through the lens of the past you know, mm. told in metaphor. And I think those issues are, are very, very common to us all. And as I said, unusual characters in an extraordinary setting 
always makes, I think, for a good viewing. Yeah. So what stage of the process are you at now? Well, we are, we're now out to various potential production partners to assist us with the packaging of the series. And that can be across the board from casting ideas to financing or filming locations. So we're at the very early stage at the moment. I think we're just taking our time with it and just uh, cherry picking the people that we think could really add value uh, to the project in those different areas. Yeah. Have you thought about casting at all? Or do you have a dream cast, so to speak? (laughs) (laughs) Well, Shayla and I, we discussed this. One of (laughs) a couple couple of names came up, which are great. I saw recently saw Sam Rockbar, but he's just amazing. He's just fantastic. And we were like, oh, yeah, it could be great. But just prior to that, we both latched on to Billy Bob Thornton, who just by coincidence, I'll let Shale jump in here because there's a whole backstory to, oh, wow. to his life as well. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny that that question, because I have never worked with anyone that just felt like we were just so in sync. Everything that we we kind of come up with, and we've been working together for almost a year now, if not over a year, I can't remember. But um, yeah. we've been we've been working, and we we will just like one thing will come into our mind, and the other one finishes it. You know, <laughs> it's like someone starts it, the other finishes the other, and so you get these ideas, and you're going, yes, I was thinking that too, and it's so interesting, and it's fun to work that way, not just because we think alike, but we also come to it from a different point of view. Mm. And so, Mm. but the end result is like, oh, yes, you know, this is great for the project. And so when we came up with, and I don't know who said it first, but it it might have been a JR that said it first about Billy Bob Thornton. And even though the, the age difference between our main character and him but there is a lot of music in there, which, you know, Billy Bob Thornton has a band and he plays kind of a very similar kind of thing. And he just has that kind of, you know, that personality and that performance, I think, of, about him and yeah. Bling Blade, for example, you know, <laughs> which is one of my favorite films. And so, you know, just that kind of, personality there and then we both thought oh yeah wouldn't he be great to get him into some place within the project and then it turns out that he was actually born in Arkansas oh really and he was yeah and he was born in Hot Springs which is if you're reading the book there's a huge scene and that's kind of at the beginning of a lot of things that happen that's where you know, one of the characters is put on trial for being a communist and, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's all kinds of things that are happening right there in Arkansas, but there is, you know, definitely a scene in Hot Springs. And in fact, Billy Bob Thornton won a a baby contest in Hot Springs. (laughs) 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 Yeah, I had no idea, you know, that there was that connection, let alone I, after we were thinking about him, I went back and did some research and, and heard him on an interview saying that he was in a, a won a baby contest. <laughs> so we would just, you know, I just think that there's, you know, kind of that simpatico right there, you know, with him. So we'll be, I mean, JR is working on that angle as we speak. So, yeah. um, but it would just be lovely to have him only because of his personality, I think, which just kind of represents yeah. a very, the tone yeah. of the yeah. project. So, absolutely. We'll, we'll very, see. Yeah. And it is very much like that now, now with, with, I guess, the, you know, the whole, the emphasis on having huge stars in a film with a big theatrical release, you know, with the advent of, you know, Netflix and yeah. Disney, HBO, Amazon. That's changed to some extent. So, so it's become more about the quality of the work. So that's given us great freedom to really think about who are the people that are going to enhance this project, whether they're names or not names. Mm-hmm. And what, how are they going to really enhance the project? And like I said just a little bit earlier, contribute that emotional resonance within the pages to something that we're going to ultimately see on the screen. 
Yeah, yeah. It's so exciting. I'm so excited. I'm yeah, not even yeah. involved. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> It, it takes a village, right? And I, yeah. I, I think that's one of the things that makes this project so, it's relaxed. You know, I want to say it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely a relaxed project because the sense is we're playing the long game. You know, it's like mm-hmm. what's best for the project. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. kind of part of how we are positioning, how our partnership works and how the project works is like best idea wins. And yeah. and sometimes it takes a while to get to that best idea. And it definitely takes a while to get the right people together mm-hmm. on this. Mm-hmm. And so we want to take our time and we want to do it right. And I think that is going to eventually work to our advantage. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's no rush, really. Yeah. No, this story's already been done, you know, I mean, yeah. it's already yeah. happened. And so the fact that we have a complete line on it as being very connected to the real characters based mm-hmm. on it, you know, it's based on the true story and we're connected to those characters. Mm-hmm. So it's not, you know, something that we feel very competitive, that there's a competitive edge which means that we can focus on the creative side of it and making it a really outstanding project. Right. That's it. And I think just taking our time getting it into the hands of the right person. Yeah. Because I think if we do that, if we achieve that, I think like as we're all sitting here now, you know, if you read it, you're going to be sold. Yeah. Actually, we've had some cold readings to it now to some colleagues of, uh, JR's colleagues who have come back and first looked at a very small, like our sizzle on it, but then come back and immediately, and they're in the process of like, okay, now I want to read the book. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's actually a really good sign. I think that, you know, the, our sizzle just worked it. We took our time with it. I mean, JR did a fabulous job on that. And to kind of outline what that is. And that's enough to say, okay, so, you know, let me get that book going. So, you know, people that we are being cautious about um, yeah. presenting this project opportunity, the response has been good. Yeah. So um, they're in that process right now. So we'll, we'll yeah. see where that goes, but I have no doubt that the right person, the project will fall in exactly where it needs to be. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Of course, do you still have a couple of books to write or have have you started the second? (laughs) Yes, yes, indeed. Um, No pressure. I am. There's no pressure at all. Yeah. So because I wrote it, broke it (laughs) so many times, I actually, it it was originally going to be one book. That was it. I was just going to do one book and move on to some other books Mm -hmm. after. But because this became so large, I had to actually divide that book into three, which is how it actually became a trilogy. So book two and three are already have well started, but now I am finishing book two, I think, by early next year in Mm. Q1. Okay, wow. So we're we're moving along. (laughs) It's a lot of words. Shirley keeps on teasing me with these little vignettes, these little stories that are (laughs) Is that going to be in the book? Yes, that's in the book. I've just written that since last, oh, please. Fantastic. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, I feel like the words are in the right hands. <laughs> well, and I told him this last week. I said, yeah, I said, you know, yeah, I'm at like, you know, 45,000 words or so now. And, and he was like, and I said, yeah, I, I could clean some of that up. I said, you know, um, you know, run spell check and stuff like that and feed you a couple of chapters if you like. And he was like, well, yes. <laughs> like, hell yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, no holding out on me here. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, no. I know. <laughs> and he's so patient. He's so patient. He goes, oh, where is that? Where is that? Where, where, how much do you have done? Yeah. And he, he doesn't like push me. He doesn't push me. And then I'm like, well, maybe he really doesn't want to read it right now. You know? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> I'm savoring so it. That's why. <laughs> yeah. I get that savoring bit, JR, because yeah. I not only read the book, but I listened to the audio book as well. And I had like a, a different experience with each format. Like I really loved the audio book because I thought the voice actors were just spot on. They did a remarkable job. And then I loved the written book, the printed book, because I loved getting all the historical detail that Shayla has in the footnotes. So it was just that combined experience. I'm recommending the combined experience until <laughs> the film comes out. Well, and this is the thing. Audiobooks, they're becoming uh, a platform in their own right. Mm -hmm. And um, the way the market's evolving, the research, when we were looking into it, there's very much people are kind of consuming it over the printed word. And actually, some authors are releasing audiobooks before they release the print versions mm. of the books, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the advances in spatial and immersive audio is also really taking hold my, a colleague of mine that i work with he's a, one of the kind of world leading exponents on on this side of things and many of the streaming services many of the the big audiobook companies are going back to him to rework some of their big titles mm. with that spatial and immersive audio and the sense of, of actually you know placing us in, in in the middle of the action yeah. So I think it's something that's going to expand very much. And, and we may well revisit uh, Perpetual Gloom with that kind of spatial and immersive um, angle as well sometime uh, down the line. But yeah, yeah it, it's a very exciting thing to have, to be able to experience the same thing in two different ways. Or yeah. You get the series going three different ways. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I read books for a living, so but I love audiobooks. And I'm finding myself gravitating to, okay, I go and check Amazon or wherever to see if it's on audiobook first, because I'll if it's on yeah. audiobook, I'm going to get it first. Yeah. And then like I did with, you know, Perpetual Gloom, I'll, I'll, I may do both. I may read, read and listen, but yeah. I, I like having all those options as a reader. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And as JR was saying, that's just going to explode because now there's these people whose vocation is actually reading, is, mm -hmm. you know, they're audio actors, or what would you call them, JR? They're, um, yeah, yeah, voiceover artists, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the one that we had on ours, Anthony, he grew up in Louisiana and now lives in Mississippi. But he has an amazing collection of of accents and characters, like over 40 of them. Oh, wow. That he works with. And so we're going to see, I think, a lot of that. That That is like kind of what Ralph was saying, that, that this is a new art form within itself. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll just see that grow. Yeah, yeah. He did it's an amazing true. job. I, I, he did. I learned so much from that because uh, I would send some notes back to him about you know, uh, no, such and such a phrase, can we pronounce it like this or pronounce it like that? And it's like, no, that's how we pronounce it here. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it, it, it kind of drove home my, my ignorance and those little nuances of the local pronunciation of certain words. And I was like, okay, I just need to step back because I, it's balancing between something that's authentic and something that is, you know, received pronunciation in the sense of a general English speaking audience. But yeah, yeah I, I think having that authenticity from somebody who knows how phrases sound is critical, absolutely critical to it. And Anthony was great in just steering me <laughs> into that. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think you just mentioned authentic, and I think that's the overall tone of the project that I'm seeing so far, just the authenticity. And I think that's going to carry you all a long way. Yeah. 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 I'm sure it will. Yeah. Well, is there anything else y'all would like to add today? No, I don't think so. Apart from the message to Shayla, make sure you look both ways when you cross the road because books two and three, I'm absolutely waiting for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am held up on the island. Good. <laughs> Going out. <laughs> we'll slip her trays of food under the door so she can keep writing. Absolutely. And, yeah. absolutely. This exactly. is it. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. Shayla and JR, it's really been a pleasure talking with you. I'm so excited for your project, and I really want to thank you for sharing everything with me today and look forward to seeing what you all have to come. Likewise, Sherry. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sherry. 
Thank you so much for joining me today for my interview with Shayla Johnson and J.R. Santana. To learn more about their work, visit thebalonitrail.com. And be sure to check out our other interviews on InsideScootLive.com.